Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? And welcome to the OGSM webinar series. On the, uh, today is the turn of the urogynecology to present uh, something that is common, which is overactive bladder. Uh, I am Dr. Ng Poin. I'm a consultant urogynecologist with uh, Kuala Lumpur Women and Children Hospital, now known as Hospital Tunku Arziza. So when I first started uh, to start urogynecology back in 2006, uh, I don't see much of overactive bladder because most of the patients do not know uh, about this disease and they think it's a part of aging. So, but as time passed, uh, we have a lot of seminars, a lot of workshops for the uh, uh, doctors and the patients. More and more patients start coming to us with overactive bladder syndromes. And uh, I still think we're still at the tip of the icebergs. And there are many more patients out there who actually have overactive bladder. So without uh, further uh, ado, there are a few housekeeping I would like to tell you about. That is, that if you have any question, please go to the Q&A and ask your question. So today we've invited three speakers from Malaysia, our own local speakers. They're all very expert in handling overactive bladder. And uh, all of them have seen a group, a lot of patients with overactive bladder. So uh, our speaker will talk to you on basics of overactive bladder, what are the treatment available, and introducing a new drug, which is a different group altogether. And um, how to, and also we'll touch a little bit on the irretractable overactive bladder, what are the options available. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. She is Dr. Tan Gek Im, and she is from uh, Hospital Wanita and Kanak Kanak uh, uh, Sabah. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Tan is, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Dr. Tan uh, is, uh, underwent her undergraduate training at International Medical, uh, Medical University and obtained her MRCOG in 2011. She has worked in General Hospital in the states of Perak, Penang during her service with Ministry of Health. So she had pursued her subspecialty in urogynecology, the Ministry of Health Malaysia, and she spent a year training in uh, Brisbane uh, under uh, Dr. Professor Judith Go, and, and currently based in Hospital Wanita and Kanak Kanak in Kota, Kinabalu, Kota Kinabalu, and is responsible for providing urogynecology service in the state of Sabah. Dr. Tan is also a member of International Urogynecology, uh, Urogynecology Association and International Continent Society. She has a passion for teaching and humanitarian work in Africa and Asia. So without further ado, Dr. Tan, will you proceed with your topics on the basics of overactive bladder? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ng, for that kind introduction. Uh, I hope my slides are showing. And Thanks. I'd like to thank OGSM. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to thank OGSM as well for this opportunity to present the first lecture, the introductory lecture of this webinar series. So I'm going to talk about overactive bladder, the basics, before we come to the exciting part of how to manage, which our other speakers will go through. So it's nice to see Dr. Ida and Mr. Warren again. So in this short lecture, I'm going to go through what the definitions are pertaining to the overactive bladder, what the prevalence of OAB is, just a short run through on the physiology of maturation, what causes the OAB symptoms, how do we assess and finally investigate. So I'm not going to talk about management at all. So very simply put, I think this picture shows the overactive bladder syndrome very well. So with a normal bladder, the detrusor contracts only with a full bladder. 
with the overactive bladder, it contracts inappropriately when the bladder is underfilled. So this will explain the symptoms that the patient will need to present with. So by definition, what is the overactive bladder? This is defined as the presence of urinary urgency, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia, with or without urinary urgency, urinary incontinence, and in the absence of urinary tract infections or other obvious pathology. So this is a definition by the IUGA and ICS. Other definitions we need to know in order to manage or um, sort of get the symptoms of the OAB, urinary urgency defined as a sudden compelling desire to pass urine, which is difficult to defer. Frequency is defined as, the new definition says, it's a complaint that micturation occurs more frequently during the waking hours than previously deemed normal by the woman. So this definition has changed somewhat. We used to use a cutoff point of more than seven voids during the daytime. So as with other guidelines, our definitions have become more patient-centered. So if she says she's passing more frequently, she is and she requires your attention. Nocturia is defined as a complaint of interruption of sleep one or more times because of the need to mixture it. So each void must be preceded and followed by sleep. So this excludes the group of women with insomnia who go multiple times just out of convenience. With urgency, urinary incontinence, this is involuntary loss of urine associated with the urgency. So with urogynecology, we've managed two main types of stress incontinence. Obviously, there are other diagnoses, but in order to approach the overactive bladder syndrome appropriately, we need to distinguish between stress incontinence, urge incontinence, simply because the modality of treatment differs very significantly. So with stress incontinence simply defined as involuntary loss of urine on effort. So anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure, including physical exertion, sneezing, coughing. Okay? Urgency, as we defined before, is a loss of urine associated with, sorry, urgency incontinence defined as involuntary loss of urine associated with urgency. So how do we distinguish the symptoms when the patient simply walks into your office and says she's leaking? So with the OAB, they will complain of urgency, may or may not, rather, urgency. They go frequently. So this is the old definition that says eight times. And they will have nocturia occasionally. So when they say they leak, what is useful to ask them is, they may volunteer a history that I leak on the way to the toilet. But again, it's quite difficult to distinguish. Was this a real urgency leakage or could she have been having an incidental stress leakage on the way to the loo? So what is important or useful to ask them was the leak large. So with the OAB patients, when they leak, they're unable to stop the flow. So they tend to empty most or all the bladder contents. With stress incontinence, it's different. They can actually contract the pelvic muscles and stop the leaks. So spectrum of OAB, we have the straightforward overactive bladder symptoms only. On the other hand, we have the straightforward stress incontinence symptoms. When the symptoms are mixed, then things become a little bit more complicated because you need to address both. The OAB cycle is one of a vicious cycle. So the detrusor overactivity, the, which is the pathophysiology, leads to urgency. So the patients need to rush. If they don't get, they leak. Because of this embarrassing symptom or the need to rush, they tend to go more frequently just in case to avoid an embarrassing episode. And when they get into a habit of doing that, the bladder capacity becomes reduced and that bladder unfortunately gets used to small volumes. And this again, proceeds the cycle. So our duty as physicians is trying to break that cycle. When we are addressing patients with incontinence symptoms, we need to ask, could it be something other than stress and OAB, which we see on a more frequent basis? So urinary tract infection is something very easy to exclude and also very easy to treat. Um, we treat the infection and the symptoms disappear. Diabetes is important to exclude in our populations, the older populations especially, because the polyuria and the polydipsia leads to symptoms that might confuse us as OAB. Overflow incontinence, again, important to exclude in patients with neurological conditions, but also in our patients with prolonged diabetes because they can have some sort of autonomic dysfunction of the bladder. So bladder becomes paralyzed, tends to overflow because the bladder does not explode, it needs to empty, so they present with symptoms such as stress leakage, frequency urgency as well. So this confuses the spectrum. Continuous incontinence suggestive of fistula must be considered in all patients that underwent pelvic surgery. 
including patients who underwent hysterectomy, cesarean sections, because sometimes we might miss an occult injury to the lower urinary tract. So this is important to address. How prevalent is OAB? So literature has reported prevalence from 10 to 16% in the world population. So we need to remember this will be much higher because women don't tend to come and volunteer these symptoms on their own. Up to 50% by age 60 or 80, and it has higher prevalence than um, stress incontinence in our aging population. So just a little bit on bladder physiology and pathophysiology. So the simplest conclusion to explain how the bladder works, the storage and emptying can be seen as complex neural circuits in the brain and spinal cord. And these coordinate the activity of the smooth and striated muscle in the bladder and urethra. So emphasis on brain and spinal cord, I will tell you why in a bit. These circuits act as on-off switches to alternate between storage and elimination. So a very simple concept to grasp. So in a nutshell, the bladder is controlled by, again, brain and spinal cord. So there is the sympathetic innervation from T10 to L2. So this controls storage, innervates the bladder detrusor and the bladder neck. The parasympathetic pathways of S234 are responsible for voiding. Again, innervates the detrusor and bladder neck. And there is a somatic pathway that comes through the pudendal nerve, and this innervates the uh, external urethral sphincter. So this gives us a degree of voluntary control. So I've explained this. So sympathetic comes through the hypogastric, and they control the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. So we need to get a picture so it's easier to understand when the subsequent speakers talk about management. Parasympathetic via the uh, muscarinic receptors, M2 and M3, effectively contracts the detrusor and the somatic nerve supply comes through pudendal nerve and is responsible for the urethral sphincter control. And by and by, the central regulation is overriding. So you have the pontine micturition center and the continence center, which supplies the motor neurons located in the sacral spinal cord. So this controls the whole process of the bladder storage and elimination. So when we go down to the um, receptor level, parasympathetic controls the M2, M3 effectively and contracts the smooth muscle. Sympathetic, on the other hand, controls the beta-3 adrenergic receptors, relaxes the smooth muscle. So this is again repetitive. So the important um, receptors that we want to focus on, M2, M3, as well as the uh, alpha receptors, beta-3. So what are the conditions that can cause these OAB symptoms? So we have the range of urological diseases. So detrusor overactivity are caused by lesions at the suprasacral spinal cord and the higher centers. So anything that affects the brain or spinal cords at the suprasacral level, including multiple sclerosis, cerebrovascular accidents, Parkinson's, dementia, tumors, and spinal cord injury. Urogynecologic conditions that can mimic symptoms of OAB, urinary tract infection, hypersensitive bladder disorders such as interstitial cystitis, radiation cystitis. And the other hand, structural or anatomic conditions, including bladder outlet obstruction. So this is quite important because we find by and by with pelvic organ prolapse, there is a pathophysiology that says that the prolapse causing obstruction will lead to bladder muscle ischemia. So when this ischemia happens, it remodels the way the afferent and efferent nerves work and they can by and by cause OAB. So we find that when we treat patients with prolapse, a certain percentage of them even with pastries or surgery, the OAB symptoms disappear. Radical pelvic surgery can denervate the bladder. Pregnancy and pelvic mass can cause intra-abdominal raised pressure, so causing OAB symptoms, as well as a diverticulum and some intravesical lesions, such as bladder tumor, mimicking symptoms of frequency urgency. So when it comes to um, assessment of these patients, so just... Taking a history about incontinence is not adequate for us to treat the patient entirely because now we believe in this uh, umbrella of the pelvic floor dysfunction. So women with urinary incontinence will also have an overlap or might have an overlap of prolapse, voiding dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, sexual dysfunction. So when we want to address this in a urogynecologic setting, we tend to address it entirely. So when it comes to taking a history, we elicit all symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction as per previous slide. And more importantly, we want to look at the quality of life impact, uh, including the limitation on the daily activities. 
We also want to know what the patient's coping mechanisms are in terms of the um, use of anti-incontinence, uh, things such as diapers and their expectations. So when we take a history from the patient, we want to know what their total fluid intake is. It's important because when they drink more, they will pass more urine. How much do they drink at night? Because this can lead to nocturia and their intake of bladder irritants such as caffeine, alcohol, caffeinated drinks. Medical history, medication history, and pelvic surgeries as per differential diagnosis previously. In terms of examining the patient, the important thing I want to focus on is the cognitive function. This is important because some of our OAB drugs will affect cognition. So whether the patient is a well elderly patient or not. We also look at neurological systems, including the sacral neural pathways and lower extremity edema can cause nocturia at night. And perineal examination for conditions such as atrophy, periurethral masses, whether they have a concurrent prolapse or stress incontinence. Investigations that we do for OAB patients. So number one, urinalysis and culture, very easy to do and screen, a bladder diary, and measurement of the post-void residual volume. Specific investigations that we might think about, urine cytology, urodynamic studies, and cystoscopy if we suspect in patients with mesh erosion. So again, frequency, urgency, symptoms can present in a lot of conditions. Investigations, urine dipstick, we tend to do for all women who present to us with incontinence symptoms because it's very easy. So depending on the center, some of us tend to do a urine microscopy first. And if it's suspicious or if the patient has symptoms, then we go on to do a culture and sensitivity. Some clinicians do them together. Urine cytology might be useful if the patient has microscopic hematuria as part of the workup if you suspect malignancy of the bladder or the upper tracts. A bladder diary for three full days according to guidelines in suspicion of OAB. So this is an, exam an example of a bladder diary. So if she takes the urge episodes, the stress episodes, the leakage episodes, how much she passes, how frequently she passes urine, what she drinks, how much she drinks. So this gives us a good idea on what's going on with the patient. And also it is a good feedback for the patient themselves. So they can sort of understand what they're doing each time they go to the toilet, what volumes they pass, and it helps us to modify their habits. A post white residual, again, very simple to do in a clinical setting. If she volunteers symptoms, suspicious or voiding dysfunction. So if she were to have a high post void residual, we need to plan management in terms of how we're going to plan our surgery. We have to take this into account. If we choose to manage this conservatively, she needs long-term surveillance because with a high post void residual volume, this tells you that the bladder is paralyzed or there's an obstruction going on, and this will lead to hydronephrosis and destruction of the kidneys. So this is a simple way or formula to measure the post void volume. So we measure in three dimensions, uh, the height, the width, and the length of the bladder, and there are certain coefficients depending on what literature you follow. Eurodynamic studies. So this is an example of a Eurodynamic study chart. We perform a Eurodynamic study to answer the Eurodynamic question. So how we do this, why we do this, because we want to reproduce the patient's symptoms make certain measurements and try and figure out what is the pathophysiology of the symptoms that she's presenting with. The usefulness of doing urodynamics is to guide our management. We tend to improve our outcomes and predict potential post-operative problems. Okay, So if she has a detrusor overactivity before surgery, it helps us to counsel the patient so her expectations will be real. So she won't be surprised and say, how come you operated on me but I still have urine leakage. So if you had a urodynamics that showed the existence of detrusor overactivity before that, it's easy to counsel the patient and sort of make her expectations a little bit more real. So point to emphasize, we do not perform urodynamic studies before starting conservative management. So by and by, we have referrals coming to do urodynamics to distinguish between stress and urge. So that's not quite the way to go because we treat stress and urgency incontinence based on symptoms. So we would probably listen to what the patient tells us, treat conservatively first, even start the pharmacologic treatment first. And if that fails and we're still confused, then perhaps we move on to doing urodynamic studies. So the guideline will tell you this criteria to perform urodynamic studies in patients before we perform surgery. If they have predominant urgency or if you're not sure what sort of um, incontinence she has, if that's an element of voiding dysfunction, occult stress incontinence perhaps, or previous failed therapy or surgery. 
This is an example of a urodynamic study showing us detrusal overactivity with leakage. So again, why we don't do this to distinguish, we don't do urodynamics to distinguish stress from urge, we find that the OAB patients, probably only half of them will have urodynamic abnormality of detrusal overactivity during the test. And on the other hand, only one quarter or 25% of people who show up DO on your urodynamic study actually have symptoms. So we don't treat the test, we tend to treat the patient. So we do urodynamic studies when the diagnosis is still confused or after failed treatment. So that's the rule of thumb. So this is the guideline pertaining to non-neurogenic overactive bladder in adults by the uh, AUA. So I'm not going to go through management at all, otherwise my other speakers will not be thrilled. Um, so history and physical examination, perhaps a urine analysis. If the diagnosis is still unclear, we consider doing a urine culture, a post void residual bladder diary, or a symptom questionnaire. So that will give us a good picture on how the quality of life is affected. If it is OAB, then we move on to the treatment. So again, emphasis on history. So by the history, we need to decide or commit to is she having stress incontinence, urge incontinence, mixed incontinence of both or something else entirely. So with that clinical assessment, consider imaging, consider urodynamics. If she has a complicated incontinence with conditions such as recurrent incontinence, um, if she's had previous pelvic irradiation, previous surgery, so we might consider doing a cystoscopy, further imaging with perhaps an ultrasound or imaging of the upper renal tracts or urodynamics. Okay, so again, I'm not going to go into treatment at all. I leave this to our other esteemed speakers. So indications for referral into specialist or tertiary care. So people with just Overactive bladders can be treated at primary care by conservative treatments. If the center has anticholinergics and we know how to use it, fair and well, go ahead. If patients have incontinence with persisting bladder or urethral pain that might suggest a bladder pain syndrome, if they are concurrent with benign masses, pelvic masses, if they have an element of fecal or urinary incontinence, presence of voiding difficulty or neurologic diseases, or any of the previous continence surgeries, previous cancer surgeries, or previous radiation, it might be a good idea to refer them into tertiary care because the management will be a little bit more complicated. So that was my last slide. So I'm going to end this talk here and pass back to Dr. Ng before we go on to the management discussion by the other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Uh, we'll take the question after we after the, the after the in the question and uh, question and answer session. So our next speaker, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We'll talk on current management of overactive bladder. Is Dr. Ida Lilawati Matlata. She is she graduated from University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, with Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery, where she later attained her master's in obstetric and gynecology. She's a senior lecturer. She was a senior lecturer in University of Malaya and later underwent fellowship uh, in urogynecology in minimum and minimal assess surgery in Kamida Medical Center. She's now a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist in Pantai Chera since May 2018. And Dr. Ida has been actively involved in med educa medical education and has been presenting in ONG-related meetings and conferences. She's currently the treasurer of Malaysian Urogynecology Society and also a member of International Urogynecology Association and International Continent Society. Without a further ado, Dr. Ida. Thank you, Dr. Ng, for a very kind introduction. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Ida Liliwati from Pantai Hospital, Chiras. So before we start, I would like to thank UJSM and the organizing committee for inviting me for the session. So just now, Dr. Tan Ji has uh, given a thorough explanation on the basics of uh, overactive bladder physiology and assessment of patients. And next, we will be looking into the current treatment of overactive bladder in general, tailoring as much as possible into our local clinical settings and practice. So the term overactive bladder syndrome has been incorporated into the terminology by the International Continent Society in 2002. 
and it generally describes the symptoms of uh, complex, a symptom complex of urinary urgency, usually with frequency and nocturia. This is known to have a significant effect on quality of life, sleep quality for the patients, and in general, emotional well-being of the patients as well. So in one large population-based study using this definition, symptoms of overactive bladder were reported in about 12.8% of women, and nearly half of these women also reported urinary incontinence, which is in about 6.3% of cases. However, despite the relatively high prevalence of symptoms, only 60% of these individuals seek help, and of these, only 27% receive treatment. So 20% out of these patients consulted a doctor within a year of symptoms becoming troublesome. One third of them delayed for up to five years for treatment and a quarter actually waited for more than five years to seek treatment. So from this data given, these figures actually shows that overactive bladder is a condition which is potentially underreported and also generally undertreated. Globally, treatment of overactive bladder emphasizes on a multidisciplinary appro approach, which includes steps as simple as offering guidance in choosing protective incontinence garments as a coping mechanism for the women. The aim of treatment is mainly to improve quality of life for the patient and at the same time minimizing adverse effect and morbidity in this, um, in this uh, vulnerable elderly group of women. So the, the treatment should be based on patients' lifestyle changes supplemented by pharmacotherapy with consideration of hormone therapy in selective group of patients. In minority of refractory cases, uh, um, we can also offer either neuromodulation, surgery or botulinum toxin, which may also confer an advantage for these patients. So treatment of overactive bladder is initiated with the same lifestyle and behavioral modification that are used for other types of incontinence in women. Other lifestyle changes include cessation of smoking, uh, cessation of alcohol intake leading towards healthier lifestyle in which it will directly help in weight reduction and improving symptoms of overactive bladder. The combination of behavioral therapy with pharmacotherapy also appears to be more effective than either approach alone. For example, in one multi-center randomized control trial done in 2000, addition of a behavioral training and exercise program to anticholinergic cholinergic therapy did have a beneficial effect on patient satisfaction self-reported improvement and reduction of other bladder symptoms. Thus, despite of its presumed simplicity, the role of behavioral therapy in treatment of overactive bladder should not be underestimated. As a continuation of what Dr. Tanji Ai has explained about fluid management just now, comprehensive advice based on observations from the bladder diaries regarding fluid intake minimizing caffeinated and alcohol drinks, along with advice on timing of drinks, for example, avoidance of late night fluid often yields significant benefits for these women. This is especially beneficial in those women with abnormally high or abnormally low intake of fluid and those with symptoms of nocturia. The volume of fluid consumed should also be assessed. For example, too much of fluid intake will aggravate frequency. On the other hand, extreme fluid restriction may also result in concentrated urine, which will irritate the bladder urethrium and further cause frequency as well. So for this, we need to find a, a fine balance between excess and restriction. And in generally in my practice, for example, I usually advise my patients to drink to test in moderation and not to excess as a part of fluid management among these women with incontinence. Obesity is well known as an independent risk factor for the prevalence of urinary incontinence as well as overactive bladder. So in addition to other conservative measures, significant benefits can be achieved by weight loss in obese patients. This should be offered as a first-line treatment to all women with overactive bladder with a body mass index of 30 or greater. Next is pelvic floor muscle therapy or pelvic floor muscle training which may also confer some benefit in women with overactive bladder to suppress urgency episodes, retrosal overactivity, and urgency incontinence episodes. So this remains the key factor in treatment of overactive bladder. 
Kegel exercise, as it is more popularly known, acts by occluding the urethra to prevent leakage during detrusal contraction and further inhibits and suppress detrusal contraction. However, despite its presumed simplicity to conduct, almost 30% of women has not been doing the exercise correctly, thus impairing its benefit and efficiency as a part of treatment for overactive bladder. Supervision by a trained physiotherapist has been shown to confer benefit as compared to unsupervised training among patients with urinary incontinence. Bladder training aims to restore central cortical control through consistent incremental voiding regimes. Several methods for bladder tra retraining has been described, for example, from the voiding, time voiding, habit retraining, and bladder drill. Bladder retraining may be as effective as drug therapy, but needs to be built into lifestyle changes to achieve long-term benefit. And because of this, it is often used in combination with antimascarinic pharmacotherapy. Okay, for women with urgency symptoms who have not had sufficient improvement in their symptoms with initial pharmacological treatment, or who elect to begin pharmacotherapy before completing a trial of exercises and lifestyle therapies, a trial of medications as treatment option is also suggested. Two main classes of medications are available for treatment of OAB, the antimascarinic agents and the beta adrenergic therapy. Hormones such as estrogen and desmopressin, as well as other drugs like antidepressant, has been also looked at as an alternative or adjunct to select in selective cases. Most symptomatic women will require drug treatment, as I mentioned just now, and antimascarinic medication remains the mainstay for this purpose. However, because cholinergic receptors are widely found throughout the body, side effects are common, leading to difficulties with long-term compliance. Symptoms include dry mouth, constipation, blood vision, heartburn, and impairment in cognitive function. With this list of adverse effects, anticholinergic or antimascarinates are generally contraindicated in patients with uncontrolled arrhythmias, mastina gravis, gastric reten retention, and narrow or closed angle glaucoma. So all these conditions should always be screened prior to starting antimascarinates. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the number of anticholinergic medications available has increased. There are seven commonly used antimascarinate agents as listed, uh, which is available in different doses and formulation. These are oxybutynin, tolterodine, propiverin, trospium chloride, solifenacin, darifenacin, and fisoterodine. Recent progress include extended release formulations, alternative delivery routes like subdermal patch and gels, as well as enhanced bladder or M3 receptor selectivity. Each of these antimascarinic drugs have their own strengths and limitations. They should be carefully selected according to patient's background profile, drug availability in the countries or in certain, uh, um, in certain areas, and through entire cost assessment by the clinicians. Fisoterodine has been introduced as 4 and 8 mg extended release preparation. It acts as a product and is metabolized to 5-hydroxymethyl tolterodine. So the main difference compared to tolterodine is that fisoterodine metabolism is facilitated by peripheral esterase rather than in the liver, so that its metabolism is consistent throughout the population. So this is why fisoterodine, or the uh, product name for it is Tovias, can be marketed into those preparations. Oxybutynin, on the other hand, has a well-documented efficacy in the treatment of detrusal overactivity and is becoming more widely available with new and novel delivery system in patch form, which has better side effect profile. Of note, immediate release oxybutynin is the first line treatment recommended by NICE guideline. Tolterodine, as mentioned just now, is a potent and competitive antagonist of mascarinic receptors. However, it has no selectivity for the subtypes of mascarinic receptor. Nevertheless, it seems to show greater selectivity for the bladder over the salivary gland. Um, another drug, trospium chloride, which is a quaternary ammonium compound. It is a non-selective for mascarinic receptor subtypes and shows low biological availability. Because of this, it is not found to cross the blood-brain barrier and as such is a preferable drug among the elderly patients, especially those with dementia. Last but not least, propiverin is an anti-mascarinic agent that is one of the popular anti-mascarinic agents in Asian countries, 
mainly due to its cost benefit with comparable effectiveness among other anti-mascarinics. So based on quality of life assessment that has been used as endpoints in most trials, benefits have been demonstrated for anti-mascarinics as compared to placebo. So uh, this is one of the systemic review, including 72 randomized trials found that rates of medication discontinuation due to um, adverse effect range from 1% to 6%. The review also shown that tolterodine and trospium has been similarly effective at treating urinary incontinence. There is also no difference between trospium chloride when compared to oxybutynin for continence or improvement of urinary incontinence. And in addition to this, there is also no statistically significant difference in improvement rates found in comparisons of immediate release oxybutynin and immediate release tolterodine. Despite the similarity in its efficacy among oxybutynin and tolterodine in this study, side effect profile appears to favor tolterodine than oxybutynin, which is mainly attributable to its bladder selectivity. All anti-mascarinics similarly exert peripheral anticholinergic effects that may limit drug tolerability and dose escalation. Dry mouth is the most common adverse effect, ranging from 106 to 347 per 1,000 treated patients, followed by constipation, which happened in 12 to 80 per 1,000 treated patients. Um, other side effects like dry eye, blood vision, dyspepsia are less frequently reported. The rate of adverse effect also found to increase with higher doses of darifenacin, pisotorodin, oxybutynin, and solifenacin. There is one study looking at immediate release oxybutynin as compared to its extended release counterpart has shown that dry mouth has been the most frequently cited adverse events leading to discontinuation of the drug in the immediate release group. So this supports the extended release formulation of antimascarinics may have fewer side effects and have lower rates of discontinuation as compared with immediate release formulations. As mentioned earlier, transdermal oxybutynin has the lowest reported incidence of adverse anticholinergic side effects from large multicenter trials, and the most common adverse effect in this preparation is generally pruritus, which happens in about 15% of cases. So how do we select antimascarinic? So in general, the efficacy of all antimascarinic agents, as we know, is thought to be similar and selection of the appropriate drug for an individual patient is primarily dictated by its side effect profile, tolerability, and medical comorbidities. Another factor that needs to be taken into account, especially for those working in the private sectors, is the cost that the patient needs to bear for these antimascarinics, as most of these treatments are relatively costly. So another drug, uh, another class of treatment modality for OAB is beta-adrenergic therapy or Mirabegron. It has similar efficacy to anti-mascarinics, but may be somewhat better tolerated. It works by promoting selective beta-receptor stimulation of the detrusor muscle to enhance smooth muscle relaxation. So for this, it has been used as an alternative for women who cannot tolerate or not suitable as well as those who do not have sufficient improvement on anticholinergics. Mirabegron, or another name for it, for it is Petmega, can also be started as an initial medication wherever or whenever cost is acceptable or if insurance coverage includes. Some women can also benefit from a combination of antimascarinics and Mirabegron. But as we have another topic on this drug, after this, I think I will leave further explanation of this topic on to Dr. Lowe in the next talk on uh, Mira Begron. So another drug, imipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, has been shown to have systemic anticholinergic effects and blocks the reuptake of serotonin. Some authorities have found a significant effect of imipramine in the treatment of patients with their tissue overactivity. And considering this evidence, they are often useful in patients complaining of nocturia or bladder pain and is often added as a second agent to a conventional anticholinergics. So we know, uh, I mentioned just now that there are two types of hormones that has been used as an alternative treatment option in treatments or patients with overactive bladder, the estrogen and desmopressin. So estrogen has been important physiological, has an important physiological effect in the lower urinary tract symptoms and atrophic vaginitis, and has been implicated in the pathogenesis of several conditions, including overactive bladder. 
although there is currently no evidence to support the use of estrogen replacement in the management of urinary incontinence per se, there appears to be benefit in the use of topical estrogen treatment in relieving symptoms of overactive bladder. Desmopressin is a vasopressin analog, which is approved for nocturia in multiple sclerosis and nocturnal polyuria. There may also be a discrete role for desmopressin to control daytime overactive bladder symptoms and incontinence. However, hyponatremia is the main side effect which will occur in a minority of patients and as a result of this, serum sodium should be closely monitored initially. But generally in, generally in our practice, treatment should be avoided in elderly patients, especially those with premorbids like hypertension. So, um, in general, clinicians should avoid declaring treatment failure prematurely as improvement in symptoms can take up to four weeks and it may take up to 12 weeks for medications to have full efficacy. But what can we do if all the mentioned initial measures and treatments fail to improve patient symptoms? So if patients with overactive bladder do not respond to conservative treatments, lifestyle modification with combination of anti-mascarinic medication or beta-adrenergic therapy, then urodynamic studies may be beneficial. However, in order to be useful, the test must repro reproduce the individual symptoms over reliance of urodynamics without reference to the patient's history of failure to reproduce symptoms may reduce in reduction of diagnostic sensitivity of the test. So generally speaking, we don't treat urodynamic uh, result, but we treat the patient as they are. If detrusive overactivity is diagnosed on urodynamic, then patients may wish to consider surgical intervention. So uh, now, currently, surgical treatments include botulinum toxin, sacral nerve stimulation, clam ileocystoplasty, detrusomyomectomy, or urinary diversion. So these topics uh, or these options of treatments will be further discussed by Dr. Lowe in our next discussions on difficult overactive bladder. So in summary, we know that overactive bladder is a common disorder, yet often underdiagnosed and undertreated. Treatment of overactive bladder should be based on lifestyle changes supplemented by pharmacotherapy and anticholinergic still remain the mainstay of drug therapy with recent changes in the number of preparation and routes of administration offer some advantages in reducing side effects and maximizing the efficacy of the drugs. However, in some cases, the patient may remain refractory and in this situation, either botulinum toxin, neuromodulation or surgery may confer advantage. So I think that will be my last slide for today. Any question can be addressed at the end of the session and I return back the session to Dr. Empoyin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ida. So um, the next topic, I think there's one everyone waiting for on the new drug that's available for overactive bladder. Before that, I would like to introduce the next speaker who will be talking about the new drug that's available and difficult overactive bladder. I'd like to introduce a, a good friend of mine. He is uh, Mr. Warren Nu Hua Lund. He's a consultant urologist whose main area of practice covers a broad range of urological issues, including urinary stone, urinary tract cancers, and recurrent UTI. He sub-specialized in female urological matters such as overactive bladder and urinary incontinence, as well as men's health, which include erectile dysfunction and prostate disease. He, he performs urological implant surgeries such as sling, artificial urinary sphincters for patients with ur in urinary incontinence, and penile implants for patients with erectile dysfunction. He also performed various uh, uh, oncological procedures and he conducts uh, uh, various neuro reconstructive procedures for patients, both adult and pediatric with bladder dysfunction. And he delivered a he had delivered the largest series of Botox injections in patients with overactive bladder in Malaysia. And is the only urologist in Southeast Asia which performs sacral neuromodulation procedure for bladder dysfunction and artificial urinary sphincters for female with severe urine leak. Uh, he, he underwent subspecialty training in neuroreconstructive urology and female urology in the United Kingdom at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, Glasgow, and had a fellowship in attachment in functional urology at University Hospital California, Davis in California, United States. 
is a trained and Europe, Europe certified robotic surgery specializing in various complicated robotic surgery and prostate for prostate and kidney cancer. He obtained his fellowship training in robotic euro oncology at Peter McCallum Center. Uh, Cancer Centre in Melbourne and Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas Hospital, London. He's also trained in Paris in robotic functional urology. And uh, Dr. Lowe is also a recipient of the prestigious Toon Sophia Foundation Scholarship which supported his robotic training at Guy Hospital in London. He has delivered various oral and poster presentations both locally and internationally and has published research papers in domestic and international journals. He had chaired various neuro-urology and uro-oncology symposium across Asia Pacific and is a regular speaker at European and America Euro Urological Conferences. He's currently the principal investigator in a few international multi center trials and takes part in health awareness program and workshop in Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Korea, and Australia. Uh, he's also the examiner for the Malaysian Urological Board Examination and an adjunct professor for University of Sarawak, Malaysia. So I pass the session to Dr. Lo. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm honored to be invited to uh, give a talk on the topic, which is the role of pharmacological treatment in women with overactive bladder. So now a little bit about the definition. Overactive bladder is defined by the ICS as urgency with or without urge incontinence, usually with frequency and nocturia in the absence of pathologic or metabolic conditions that may explain the symptoms. So as you know, we usually will classify it into storage and voiding symptoms. They are all under the lower urinary tract symptoms. As you see, the storage symptoms includes frequency, nocturia, urge incontinence, and other incontinence, whereas the voiding symptoms includes the intermittency, slow stream, straining, hesitancy, and of course, we have another element, which is post-void fribble and post-void feeling of incomplete emptying of the bladder. So you can see from these slides that OAB essentially is a storage symptom. Now, you know that my topic, I'm talking about women. So storage symptoms are not sex-specific but it's also increased in an age-related fashion and are prevalent in both male and female patients. Now, since we're talking about women, we need to know the prevalence. So OAB in a population-based studies, the rate range from about 7% to 27% in men, and in women is higher, which is 9 to 43%. And since OAB is a symptom-based diagnosis, the quality of life impact symptom is the critical aspect of this condition. So now, looking at the global prevalence of the low urinary tract symptoms, you can see that in year 2008 and 2018, basically they are almost the same. And the next slides, you can see that for adults more than 20 years old, women actually have a higher prevalence rate as compared to men. And of course, in Asia, we get very similar results as well. Women a little bit higher than men, and the prevalence is about 10%. So from this, you know that overactive bladder is a highly prevalent uh, disease worldwide, and it increases with age and rates are higher in women than men. And the prevalence vary considerably by region. And urinary incontinence is the most severe form of OAB and mirrors is epidemiology. And we know that OAB is associated with considerable economic costs. Just imagine that you have to buy the diapers and you know, it will be an impact to the caregiver as well. OAB adversely impact, impact numerous quality of life measures. And the more bothersome the symptoms, the greater the impact on quality of life. After all, incontinence or OAB is basically a symptom complex. Now, after assessment has been performed, sometimes we must accept that if you don't do anything about it, it's actually perfectly acceptable. Because otherwise, you know, we are not trying to drive patients into taking medication, doing surgery and all this. If the patients are able to live with themselves, you know, a little bit of a bordism, overactive bladder or even incontinence is perfectly fine. Now, since I'm going to talk about the pharmacology treatment, and I believe Dr. Ida before me has spoken about the anti -muscarinic, I'm going to focus mainly on Maribagron, which is a beta-3 agonist. As you know, beta-3 agonist essentially 
is a medication that relaxes the detrusor muscle by actually acting on the no adrenergic uh, receptors. So what it does is that it causes uh, relaxation of the bladder. Okay. Now, the pathophysiology behind is that we know that we have these um, afferent nerve fibers, which is found in the urotelium and the suburotelial space. So all these fibers are basically taking part in the process of bladder function. Now, if there are imbalances or disturbances in this suburotelial complex, the abnormalities of the central function and also the nerve uh, conduction uh, signals will all be impaired. And this will lead to overactive bladder. So to date, there are three theories that contribute to the genesis of an overactive bladder. Essentially, is the urotelium-based hypothesis, the myogenic hypothesis, and the neurogenic hypothesis. Now, we also found that OAB basically is quite prevalent in elderly people. The reason is because they are partly denervated. Now, studies have shown that in elderly people, they actually have a smaller bladder capacity and also increased non-voiding contraction of the detrusor. So you will ask me one question, you know, the elderly people, since you said that the detrusor is partially denervated, how can they be generating overactive bladder? The answer is yes. The truth is that even in those patients who actually have their bladder taken off, and especially for urologists, we do a lot of autonomic neural bladder. Even with that, you just need to have a little bit of a suburotelia, uh, you know, nerve complexes running around that particular organ. You will have a lot of disturbance in terms of the nerve signal transmissions, and ultimately that will lead to uh, non-voiding contractions of the bladder. And of course, in elderly people, arteriosclerosis induced chronic ischemia also leads to fibrosis, smooth muscle atrophy, non-compliance, and all these things leads to small bladder with a lot of overactivity problem. Now, how do we diagnose apart from history? Obviously, you need to do things like, for example, an ultrasound to find out whether there's any other pathology, for example, bladder cancer, okay? And on top of that, since we have bladder cancer, which are quite flat, now, cystoscopy is very important, not just to rule the bladder cancer, to find out whether there's any obstructive cause, for example, a urethral stricture, even a bladder stone, that could potentially narrow down the passage and lead to overactive bladder. In men, a classic example would be prostate. Urodynamic is very important because we know everybody may, may present with some form of an overactive bladder-like symptoms, but sometimes whatever that the patient present, the patient present may be quite different from what the patient has. So in order to find out what the patient has, we have this urodynamic or bladder function study or bladder pressure studies that will actually identify different types of uh, bladder dysfunction. Now, some patients' additional measures may be required, okay? So apart from urodynamic, we may actually need MRI of the pelvis to find out whether there are any other associated pathology. So this is just some image to show uh, the cystoscopy as well as an ultrasound to find out whether there are any causes. And of course, uh, I guess everybody here is very familiar with urodynamics. That's how we interpret the urodynamics with the tracing. Now, first line treatment um, is always uh, behavioral therapy. So we will tell the patients to go for bladder training, biofeedback, you know, physiotherapy, pelvic floor exercise, Kegel exercise to modify their lifestyle and see whether it helps. Now, if it doesn't help, the second treatment would be um, anti or even a beta-3 agonist. So I'm not going to elaborate anything on the anti because I believe the Dr. Ida before me has spoken uh, a lot uh, about this. Uh, Totoridine, oxybutynin, you know, crospium, solipinacin, um, you know, darifinacin, and ox uh, oxybutynin. So what I'm going to talk about is Marabagrond. Now, Vibragron is another one, but it's currently not available. It's probably better because it's short-acting, but uh, we are still waiting it waiting for it to be, of course, uh, marketed in Malaysia. So at this moment, we're just going to talk about the marrow background. So I've elaborated a little bit about the, uh, the mechanism of action, which essentially is to uh, stimulate the uh, noradrenergic uh, pathway, and that leads to the uh, bladder relaxation. So, you know, in order to support what I said, I need to actually produce the paper. And then, of course, you have this randomized European Australian pastry trial, which essentially is a Scopia study. Uh, where they take all those patients, men and women above 18 years old, um, in a span of about three months, uh, with the primary objective of studying the incontinence episode as well as maturation episodes within 24 hours. And since this is a three-month studies, they use three 
different randomized arm, which is placebo, um, total redeem, as well as meropergron. And in this studies, we use only about 50 milligrams. And of course, in this study, it shows that there's a significant uh, reduction in incontinence episode in the arm of meropergron, which is 50 milligrams. Now, for the other uh, endpoint, which is reduction in the maturation frequency, as you can see from this chart, that the meropergron 50 milligrams actually do much better as compared to total reading. Okay. Now, what we are most interested in is basically the side effect. As you know, we're talking about beta-3 agonists, which is marrow background. The one that is really of an interest to us is the hypertension. So you can see from the studies here, compared to placebo and also total reading, you can see that marrow background actually doesn't have an increased uh, percentage of uh, you know, hypertensive uh, uh, you know, side effects. That is, of course, measured from here is a treatment emergent adverse events uh, in these studies. But dry mouth is significantly lower in those patients who are actually taking the meribergron as compared to totoridine and also the placebo. Now, in conclusion, meribergron 50 milligrams over a span of three months demonstrated superior efficacy compared to placebo and the primary endpoints, which is the reduction in maturation and also the incontinence episode over 24 hours is actually shown very, very clearly over here. So it is not just effective for a treatment naive patients, these patients have never been treated with any medication before, but it's also effective for those patients who have been given anti-mascarinic and it doesn't work very well, okay? So generally, it is actually well tolerated. So this study supports the efficacy of meribergone in the treatment of OAB patient. Now, coming to the next slides, you know that this Scopio study is only a study over a span of three months. Now, what about a study which is over a span of 12 months, you need to know whether, you know, in, in a longer term, for example, a year, whether the uh, effect of meropregon is sustainable, whether there's any more uh, reported side effect or not. So that's why we have these Taurus studies. Taurus studies basically is randomized into three arms. One is meropregon 50 milligrams, one is 100 milligrams, and one is totoridine 4 milligrams. And in Malaysia, at this moment of time, we don't have meropregon 100 milligrams. But these studies is good enough to show there's a significant reduction in incontinence episode, you know, stretching over uh, 12 months, okay, for marrow background. And likewise, even for maturation frequency, it shows a sustainable reduction in the maturation uh, episodes over 24 hours. Now, coming to the mean volume voided, you can see that marrow background 100 milligrams definitely allowed the patient to pass more urine as compared to 50 milligrams marrow background and uh, four milligrams total reading. So in conclusion, Taurus studies, basically is a study studying the marrow program, 50 milligrams and 100 milligrams daily over 12 months is well tolerated, okay? And then uh, it actually shows improvement in the symptoms of urinary incontinence, frequency, urgency, all right? And also it supports the long-term safety and tolerability of the marrow program in the treatment of overactive bladder. What we are most interested in is the reported side effect. So you can see that these studies also again study the side effect. And you can see very clearly that hypertension from here, mirabogram 50 milligrams is about 75, 100 milligrams is about 80, and total radium is about 78. So it's actually not any worse as compared to, in general, any other anti mascarinic And of course, the one which is really striking is actually the dry mouth. You can see from here, dry mouth is significantly lower in meribergron as compared to totoridine. But the other one which is of interest is constipation. Constipation is almost the same across the board. And of course, we have other you know, uh, reported uh, um, side effects such as urinary tract infection, nasopharyngitis. I think they are more or less almost the same across the board and it's clinically not that significant. So now, what we are most interested in when it comes to meribergron is actually hypertension and palpitation. So in this case, you can see that the, uh, the percentage of hypertension reported in meribogram 50 milligrams is 43%, meribogram 100 milligrams is 50, and total reading is 42, okay? And the other one which is of interest to us is of course the QT prolonged interval as well as the cardiac arrhythmia. As you know that this is a adrenergic agonist. So you can see from these studies here, in fact, to our surprise, the total radium actually have a higher incidence of cardiac arrhythmia as compared to meribagron 
50 and also 100 milligrams. Now, going back to the EAU guidelines 2020, it actually shows that for those patients who have overactive bladder, we can certainly offer anti-masquerading or marabagron, okay? And of course, these are only advocated for those patients who have failed conservative treatment. It means we have advocated the behavioral therapy, but with floor exercise and it really didn't work, then probably you can actually suggest them to actually consider the anti masquerading or even marabagron. So this is out in the guidelines. Now, we also have had many studies that have shown that there are patients who have switched from anti masquerading to marabagron and actually show us that they have better satisfactory rates because we know that the uh, anti masquerading often give us constipation as well as dry mouth as side effect. Constipation may be the same across the board, but dry mouth is significantly lower in marabagron. Now, this is also um, some chart to show that the, uh, the reported incidence um, of improvement from anti masquerading to marabagron, you can see that there are 55.3% of patients reported improved outcomes after a month of switching from anti masquerading to marabagron. Now, of course, we are most concerned about patients who are elderly. So there are studies, these studies is pillar studies, that shows that marabagron show equal efficacy in patients more than 65 years. As you know, that anti masquerading we sometimes hold back a little bit, giving to those patients who are a little bit elderly because of the cognitive impairment. Now, what about when it comes to marabagron? Marabagron in this study have shown that it is pretty safe, and so um, it actually demonstrated a good efficacy for those patients who are elderly with an overactive bladder symptoms. Now, is there any adverse impact on the cognitive function? So in this study, the pillar studies, um, a trial studies of about three months, it shows that there was no adverse impact at all. So it's clearly demonstrated in this chart. Okay. Now, the other thing that we are most interested in is that, you know, that I would say probably about 80 to 90% of patients who are on anti muscarinic will probably drop out after a year or two. Either they get used to the site, you get used to their lifestyle, or they try to do some form of a lifestyle modification. So now we are most interested to know whether Marabragon also exhibit the same thing. So this is a study uh, after a span of a year has shown that it actually shows that the time to discontinue the Marabragon as compared to Totorudine or other anti muscarinic is a lot uh, longer. That means to say, the persistent and adherence to marabagron is much better as compared to any other anti muscarinic Now, the other problem with the anti muscarinic is patients with glaucoma. You know, that is an absolute no-no once again. So we want to know whether marabagron is actually safe enough to be used in this group of patients. Well, the answer is that there are many studies, and this is just one of them, to show that it actually does not raise the intraocular pressure in patients with glaucoma. Again, it's a good news for us. Uh, especially treating those patients with the glaucoma issues. Now, what about the tolerability and the effectiveness of marabagron in children with an overactive bladder? Now, there are many studies, and in fact, there are many trials which are ongoing, uh, trying to uh, you know, give a pediatric group a chance to use the marabagron. So at the moment, I think, I believe we have studies uh, conducted in children between 8 to 12 years old. Uh, the marabagron dosage is from 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams, and I think the study is still ongoing, and so far it's been promising. Now, the other questions I'm often being asked is that whether the marabagron is safe enough to be used in pregnant women or in lactating women. Well, the answer is that uh, there are no studies conducted in pregnant women or even a lactating mother just yet, but we have had studies done in, in, in an animal. So they found that the, uh, for those patients, the lactating animal, uh, Marabagron was actually found in the breast milk. So this is so far that as much as we can tell you. And the other thing, the safety, safety, uh, you know, there's no uh, studies done for pregnant women, as I mentioned to you earlier on, but in animal, it's been shown to be quite safe. So at this moment of time, I think we are still trying to justify the usage of Marabagron in a pregnant woman. So until uh, further information are available at this moment of time, we still hold back a little bit uh, in terms of our patients who are pregnant. Now, of course, just like any other medications, uh, we do have some contraindications for the usage of uh, marabagron. So when we talk about uncontrolled hypertension, now, what, how do you define the uncontrolled hypertension? Essentially, it's a systolic blood pressure of 
more than 180 and diastolic of more than 110. So if you have patients of those group, I think it's best to avoid the uh, the anti uh, the marrow background. And of course, for those patients who have renal failure, uh, liver failure, or prolonged QT interval or heart arrhythmias, I think it's best to avoid that. And those patients who are already having issues with emptying the blood, that you do not want to actually make them worse by giving them the marrow background. And of course, uh, there are some patients who actually develop allergy reactions, just like any other drugs. You know, there are patients who develop reaction towards the marrow background, so it's best to avoid that. Now, because of the fact that it actually metabolized uh, with this uh, CYP3A4 and also CYP2D6, there are medications that should not be taken along together with the marabagone. Those are theorizazine, which is, of course, uh, a mental illness medication. Etoprenazole is uh, antifungal. Retinobil is for HIV. They got St. Haloperidol and Amidron because these are all medications uh, when combined together with marabagone will have excessive uh, enhanced effects. So it's best to avoid. Now, talking about the pharmacology of um, overactive bladder, we do have uh, other things such as transdermal oxybutynin, which is again not available in Malaysia. Um, what about the surgical options? Well, the other surgical options is probably the Botox that uh, we frequently talk about. And of course, ultimately, if nothing works, then we have to subject the patient to augmentation cystoplasty and also urinary diversion. So now, a little bit about the botulinum toxin. So usually for those patients who have neurogenic uh, overactive bladder, we will give them 200 units. Uh, with the uh, idiopathic uh, overactive bladder, we will give them about 100 units. Okay? So it's been recommended for those patients who failed conservative therapy, who failed pharmacological therapy, then we will subject them to use the uh, botulinum toxin. So this is basically considered as a third-line therapy. And the patients must be willing to come back for frequent Botox injection because the Botox injection only lasts for about six months. And these patients must be uh, happy to come back for, you know, the injection because, you know, it is not uh, one injection and lasts for, for, for life. And of course, when it comes to intravascular Botox, basically it can be done under local anesthesia uh, with a flexible cystoscopy and also general anesthesia with the uh, rigid cystoscopy. So you can see that uh, we inject multiple sites for neurogenic, the trusal overactivity. We use about 200 units. We inject over 30 sites. For patients with the idiopathic neurogenic bladder, we inject uh, 100 units over 20 sites. So this is a standard protocol. So you can see from here that it actually does significantly uh, causes reduction in the incontinence episodes uh, for this group of patients up to about three times um, you know, reduction okay, as compared to placebo. Now, for the frequency uh, in maturation, it also reduced up to about three times. Now, of course, it actually significantly reduces the daily urgency episode up to about 2.5 times as well. So in intravascular Botox, you know, there are patients obviously will develop side effects. So eight to 9% of patients will have urine retention. Okay, so in most of the studies, it's up to about 6%. So 6% of the patients will have to be counseled on CISC and ultimately they have to learn how to do it. They always will tell the patient and counsel the patient prior to that that they, are, they must be willing to do the CISC uh, you know, after the Botox injection because sometimes we may not be able to uh, guarantee that they will not go into urine retention. And of course, gross hematuria, uh, these are basically quite transient. And uh, you, know, you do have other side effects such as dry mouth, dysphagia, impaired vision, eyelid weakness arm weakness, leg weakness, and total weakness, basically, is the toxicity of the intravascular Botox. Now, a little bit about the surgical um, treatment, which I know that is not uh, supposed to be a topic that I'm talking about, so I'm just going to run through very quickly. Percutaneous tubular nerve uh, stimulation, basically, we actually do it in a clinic setting. It's only about 12 sessions, and the effect can go up to about three years. Uh, each session is about half an hour. We stimulate the posterior tibial nerves, which will, of course, um, stimulate the uh, sacral arc, okay? So once the sacral arc is stimulated, the overactive bladder will be dampened down to a normal bladder contractility. Now, uh, we of course have had many, many studies done to show that it actually works. There are contraindications for those patients uh, using the uh, PTNS, patients with pacemaker, patients who are more prone to bleeding, uh, patients with the nerve damage and pregnant patients, these are all contraindications. 
In fact, the PCNS is basically involving just a little tiny acupuncture needle that we actually, uh, you know, hit onto the posterior stimulant. Okay, and of course, we have many studies to show that it's actually efficacious, and it gave a sustained improvement up to about four months. And the longest studies that we have acquired is up to about three years. Okay, there's no serious adverse events. Now, sacral neuromodulation is basically the last choice, and ultimately, is the ultimatum, I would say, because sacral neuromodulation works on two extreme ends. It can be used for severe overactive bladder. It also can be used for urinary retention, means non-obstructive retention. Now, it basically consists of um, an electrical stimulator that we usually will implant it somewhere near the, uh, the sacral nerves. And the sacral nerves that we are looking at is actually S3. Okay, S3, and sometimes we use the S4. So it interrupts with the abnormal reflex arcs that results in the symptom pattern. It alters the C fibers, and it's very effective in suppressing the detrusal overactivity. Okay, so now when we put the uh, electrical stimulator in there, usually it lasts a patient for about five to seven years. Now this is how we do it. We break it into two stages. The first stage we we put the battery outside. Now, and then we give a trial of about a week and see whether it works. If it works well, then we will actually decide to put it as the permanent one. That is going to be a stage two. So stage one, the patient will have an external battery, as you can see from the picture. Stage two, the battery will be implanted inside. So after we implant it inside, we don't take it out anymore. And the patient will be given something like a remote control. And if they want to off it, like for example, some patients halfway through, they suddenly get pregnant, we can actually use the remote control just to off it and the patient can just off it on themselves. So it's pretty simple. All right, so this is actually the second stage. You can see that the wound is just about that. So the efficacy of it, you can see that it actually, for those uh, patients who actually have urgent incontinence, 79% uh, of them shows improvements, 45% actually achieve complete dryness. Now for those patients who have an urgency frequency symptoms, 64% of them show improvement, 31% are able to avoid normally. Now, for those patients who have urinary retentions, you know that until this time, we still do not have a medication that used to treat the urinary retention. So 77% actually shows improvement in terms of urine retention. 61% of them actually goes home without a catheter. Okay, so you can see how, how good it is. Now, the most common therapy-related uh, side events will be the pain at the implanted site, the lab migration, infection, technical or device problems, and adverse change in the bowel, and undesirable stimulations of sensation. So most of the time, the patients will feel that there's a little bit of vibrations over the electrical stimulator area. Some contraindications is not intended for patients with mechanical obstructions such as prostate enlargement or benign or cancer, patients less than 16 years old, safety concern in a pregnant woman, once again, or patients with a kind of pacemaker or patients with progressive systemic neurological diseases because they are very unpredictable because some of them have a known neurological disease can go from one end, the beginning of the year, to the other end, end of the year. And of course, other surgical intervention will be augmentation cystoplasty, which we seldom do nowadays for overactive bladder since the uh, introduction of better medications such as meropagron and of course, the Botox injection. And of course, detrosomyomectomy is probably a thing of the past and nowadays we seldom perform and towards the end, if all things fails, we will actually divert the uh, urine away from reaching the bladder. So when there is no urine reaching the bladder, there is no uh, detrusal overactivity. Okay. So now I think, uh, of course, there are other things such as indwelling catheter, intravesical venyloid uh, that we use, well, which is, of course, uh, not an ideal uh, treatment for patients with overactive bladder. And of course, uh, when it comes to newer things, we need to actually find a biomarker to gauge the overactive bladder and, you know, so that we can understand the pathophysiology behind it. Now, functional MRI should also provide an imaging tool to ascertain the role of central nervous system. We know that the overactive bladder is due to the uh, nerve conduction issues. And of course, the sensory signaling from the bladder and urethra has also been studied with various methods. And of course, we need to study more in depth about all this, uh, you know, the nerve conduction problem. Now, um, advanced technology, gene therapy, stem cell tissue engineering has been studied, but so far we have not seen, unfortunately, uh, a very promising results. So I think I would end my uh, presentation. So as you know, the urologist's favorite shortcut is control P. So you have to control the P for the reactive letter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Uh, we would like to uh, a short video on Meribagond. So uh, after this, we'll show you a short video on Meribagond.
A new perspective on overactive bladder, or OAB. A new perspective on overactive bladder, or OAB. Brought to you by Astellas. Symptoms of OAB typically involve sensations of urgency, with or without incontinence, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia, in the absence of any other underlying pathology. Associated with these symptoms are involuntary contractions of the detrusor muscle, which occur during the urine storage phase of micturition. In many cases, these contractions are non-voiding and do not lead to incontinence. Thanks to decades of research into bladder storage dysfunction, a new theory on OAB management is emerging. This innovative theory focuses on one key function in the bladder, relaxation of the detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle plays an important role in regulating bladder relaxation and contraction, both of which are driven by autonomic signaling. Throughout the urine storage phase, which accounts for the majority of the micturition cycle, the bladder is relaxed. The bladder is under both parasympathetic and sympathetic control. In the storage phase, which is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, relaxation and stretching of the detrusor muscle maintain low internal pressure while the bladder neck and urethra are contracted to prevent leakage of urine. Voiding of urine occurs when the bladder is in the contraction phase, as mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. In order for the bladder to empty, contraction of the detrusor muscle through M3 muscarinic signaling must occur. This reflex is triggered by the binding of acetylcholine to M3 muscarinic receptors on the surface of the detrusor smooth muscle. In the overactive bladder, the detrusor muscle may involuntarily contract during the storage phase, sometimes resulting in incontinence. One current approach to the treatment of OAB is the use of antimuscarinics, for example, solifenacin, whose mechanism involves blocking the muscarinic 3 receptors or M3 receptors, leading to inhibition of involuntary detrusor contractions. Complicating this approach, however, is the near ubiquitous expression of M3 receptors throughout the body, notably in the salivary glands, colon, and ciliary smooth muscles of the eyes. For a proportion of patients, use of antimuscarinics can lead to bothersome adverse events like dry mouth, constipation, and blurred vision. In addition, some patients fail to respond to antimuscarinics. Focusing on sympathetic bladder control, recent research has revealed one receptor to be the key modulator of detrusor muscle relaxation, the beta-3 adrenergic receptor, or beta-3-AR. The beta-ARs belong to a family of G-protein-coupled receptors that are involved with cellular signaling throughout the body. There are three subtypes of beta-AR whose messenger RNA has been detected across a wide range of tissues in humans. Beta-3 ARs are highly expressed in the human bladder, where beta-3 accounts for over 95% of the total beta-AR messenger RNA. While present elsewhere in the body, beta-3 AR expression has not been found in the salivary glands or ciliary smooth muscles of the eyes. In the bladder, beta-3 AR messenger RNA expression has been found in the detrusor muscle as well as in the urethelium. It has been shown that detrusor relaxation is mediated by beta-3 AR activation. This reflex commences when noradrenaline is released from sympathetic neurons that innervate the bladder and lower urinary tract. Binding of noradrenaline to the beta-3 AR on the surface of the detrusor muscle signals the muscle to relax. This action also determines the interval between successive voidings. Recent research on this natural pathway of bladder relaxation reveals that it is possible to relax the bladder without affecting the magnitude of the voiding reflex or muscle contractility. 
Furthermore, such signaling may prolong the duration of the storage phase. Mirabegron, a beta-3 adrenoceptor agonist developed for the treatment of OAB, can selectively enhance urine storage by targeting the natural pathway of bladder relaxation. Theoretically, Mirabegron has the potential to address the unmet need in OAB patients. This video has been brought to you by Astellas. Now is the question and answer time. Question to Mr. Warren first, because he's leaving after this. Uh, Mr. Warren, there's a few questions. Number one is there's significant association of anticholinergics with poor cognitive and impairment, cognitive impairment and dementia. Would Mera Begon be the answer for these patients who, who have uh, elderly patients who have OAB? I would say so, because uh, to be honest with you, of course, and the Anticholinergic, we do have the uh, quaternary compounds such as crosspium, which of course doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, equally good. But again, now that we have this meragregron, I think there are many studies been done for those patients who suffer from Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, and it's been found to be very effective as well. So I'm hoping that it can actually be recruited into the product insert so that we can use it. But at this moment of time, there are already many of label uses of uh, meragregron uh, for those patients. So I would and say... Not just for the uh huh. Not just for Parkinsonism. Just, mm -hmm. I would just say Trospium would be equally as good, right? Yes, that's right. I mentioned the uh, quaternary compound Crossium, mm -hmm. and I say that uh, Meraberg one would be a good alternative for that. Okay. Question number two: You say there is some ECG changes for patient who who had on Meraberg Would a, a preliminary before starting Meraberg Would you do an ECG first? Because our Malaysian think, patients have multiple medical disorders. I think the question here is that uh, whether the patient, should the patient be identified to have a prolonged QT interval, mm. should they be put on the uh, Meraberg one? My mm. answer is that if the patients were found prior to have this, then I think that we should actually be trying to avoid the usage of uh, Meraberg one. So Meraberg one, uh, I think most people will be more interested to find out whether it actually causes palpitation arrhythmia. But in most of the studies, phase three, it's been shown that it only increased the heartbeat by, by one bit per minute and the blood pressure also one millimeter mercury. So if you were to look at a lot of other studies such as Scopio and also Torres studies, and you can find that, in fact, the anticholinergic actually causes a higher uh, incidence of uh, hypertension and palpitation and also arrhythmia as compared to Meraberg-Ron. So for that, I think that... Uh, we, even though are cautiously aware about this, but at this moment of time, I don't think that any one of us have actually seen uh, patients uh, suffer from a stroke or anything like that because of the Meraberg run. But having said that, those patients with hypertension, for example, systolic blood pressure of more than 180, diastolic of 110 and above, I would say that I will definitely try to avoid using a Meraberg run. Okay. Uh, I did see also in Meraberg run, the, you, you, the product, you allow patient on patient with glaucoma to be started on Meraberg-on. So, but yes. it was not in the product insert at this moment that you can use for glaucoma patient, especially close angle. Yeah, that's right. Ex yeah, you are quite right. So to be honest with you, I think there are many things they are supposed to put it in the product insert, but it's still not there yet, but it's already been used. So if you were to search, you would find out that glaucoma, of course, anticholinergy is not uh, allowed, but Meraberg one would be a good alternative. In my own practice, I actually will use it for these three group of patients that the anticholinergy will not be no, not that suitable. Number one is the Parkinson's disease. Number two is the glaucoma. And of course, number three is the myasthenia previs, which again is contraindicated in terms of anticholinergics. Okay. And uh, question, another question on Botox. Uh, a, a question asked whether Botox can it be MS administered by only the urologist or urogynecologist too can can uh, administer Botox? I think this one you caught me. Uh, <laughs> well, the answer is that I work in many countries, so uh, you know in UK the urogynecologists are administrating the Botox as well as the urologist. But there are also countries whereby only the urologists are administering, and also there are countries whereby they are both allowed. 
So in Malaysia, we haven't actually reached a consensus just yet. But more importantly, we need to know that for talks, even though it's simple, but there are a lot of theories behind that. So injecting is not a problem. Managing the complication is a problem because a lot of us, like for example, uh, in my uh, territory, we usually deal with a lot of neurogenic bladder. Neurogenic bladder, we inject about 200 units, but not forgetting the fact that those neurogenic bladder patients also have some form of a spasticity. So the neurologists and also the rehab physicians are also using the Botox to inject it over the spastic limb. So you have to be aware that the Botox, in three months' time, you should not actually exceed about 400 units. So there's a cutoff point for that. So I think we have to work as a team to actually come up with a consensus of whether who can actually give the Botox. Because uh, the theory behind that is more important, how to deal with the Botox toxicity, how to avoid the complication. And if it does happen, for example, some patient with the some doctors who doesn't know how to inject Botox can literally just tear through the whole bladder. Are you able to handle the repair of the bladder after that? Okay, there's a, I think we should be uh, able to repair. Okay, question to Mr. Warren again. Do you do a post void residue prior to starting Merobigal? I will do a post void residual routinely, whether I'm starting the marrow background or anticholinergy, because you know, you do not want to tape them over to urinary retention. So that will be a routine for me. Okay. And questions also regarding Botox. Huh? Uh, there's a problem avoiding dysfunction, which is can go up as high as 10%. How long does this voiding dysfunction last? Or when will it start after Botox injection? So uh, you're talking about Botox injection for voiding dysfunction. So first of all, no, we need Botox to... With, uh, Botox injection for OAB. Uh, when, uh -huh. when will we start to... When we counsel patients, when will the Botox... Uh, in, after Botox injection, will, will they start to have voiding dysfunction? And when they started, how long will it be before the bladder actually return back to normal? Okay, so for example, if I were to use the urinary retention as one of the extreme examples, okay? So Botox usually does not see its effect within one or two weeks. Most of the time it's only after two weeks. So when after, you know, after the injection, the patients will, will be like normal, apart from a little bit of bleeding and a little bit of urgency and frequency. That is the usual thing. Two weeks later, when the Botox starts to show its effect, the patient will see the improvement. Whether the Botox is indicated for erective bladder or even interstitial cystitis, they will start to see the, 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 the improvement. And it picks at about three months and six months before, just before six months, the effect gradually went off. So if you were to ask me, if the patient do develop some form of a urine retention, yes, it will take up to about six months before it can actually win off on its own. Soonest also about three to four months. So the patient have to be counsel regarding, in literature, it's about 6% risk of a dysfragmentation prior to the intro for this intrapsychal botox. Six uh, percent. The question number: This is a patient who had uh, overactive bladder, uh, partially treated with anticholinergics, you know, the maximum dose, but somehow doesn't work. You need a second treatment. Is there a role for double treatment, and what drug would you use for the second treatment? Well, if you're talking about the double treatment, you can either go on uh, anticholinergic as well as a marabrigram because it's in our EAU guidelines. Okay, so this is what we call a combination therapy. Now, uh, and also, you also must be aware that there are also other alternatives apart from the oral tablet. You can also use in other country, but not in Malaysia, transdermal oxybutynin also can be used together. So this is still a combination of uh, pharmacotherapy. You mean trans, transdermal oxybutynin together with another anticholinergic or that's transdermal? Right, that's right. Oh, I thought you have to be a different group like anticholinergic and another group? Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. So just change the mode of delivery. Okay, thank you, Mr. Warren. Exactly. There are yeah. all your questions. Now, uh, there is a question to Dr. Ida. Uh, Dr. Ida, the question to you, what's the role of intravesical oxybutanin? Uh, intravesical oxybutanin, yeah. Actually, this is... This is uh, first introduced quite some time ago. It's just that it has not been used uh, much in the, our practice because of its invasiveness. So basically, uh, recent I think I have read one recent study sometime in 2018 or 2019 about this. Uh, 
generally the intravesical oxybutynin is used mainly for those patients who cannot tolerate oral oxybutynin. So logic, isn't it? You, usually if you have a mode of administration of drugs, you always go for the, for the cheapest, you always go for the um, most convenient to take. But in selective group of cases, for example, in patients who do not tolerate oral, uh, in children, in, in, in uh, younger patients, in children who have generally have neuropathic bladder, uh, there is a role of intravesical oxybutynin because uh, in this type of uh, mode of administ administration of oxybutynin, we, we avoid or we reduce the first pass metabolism of the medication itself. So, uh, there is a role, but uh, in a very, very selective group of cases. As I mentioned just now, like in children with neuropathic bladder or in older patients. But with a uh, newer development of um, um, uh, new drugs and new uh, mode of administration like uh, oxybutynin patch and oxybutynin gel, I think um, more invasive way of administration like intravesical may not be very suitable. I mean, we always go for something that is less invasive. So, uh, yes, there is a role, but um, very, very selective group of patients. Question, I think, to all of us, I think we should. The question is, uh, where is PTNS available in Malaysia? And what are its success rates? Okay, I think Mr. Warren has left. I think it's available in HKL. And I think also available in all university hospitals. And I think a few other states who have urological services. And what is success rate? I think uh, it is a second line. Can the panel answer? Anyone? Anyone? Ida or uh, GI? Um, as far as I could remember last time in UM, uh, I have never actually referred any patient to urology for PTNS. Uh, but I... Um, they, uh, I don't know. In HKL, who actually puts the... Who does the, 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 the procedure for the PTNS? I think the, the urologist has a uh, urologist, but uh, since the success of... Or maybe the surgeons? Uh, it's usually the urologist. Because but you go to the posterior tibial, right? Must be yeah. orthopedic or... I think the urologists do it, but since the success of Botox, I have not referred many patients to for PTNS. We usually go for Botox. With Botox, the success rate is so good. And then with Mirabagond, I think so far I have never referred any patient for PTNS for overactive bladder. I'm sure it's available in our urology in HKL and also all the universities in all the university, both in UKM, UM, and most of the university will have PTNS and most of the hospital with urologists should have PTNS. I think it's a secondary treatment and I don't, I think uh, the guideline says that PTNS is a secondary treatment uh, compared to anti, uh, first primary treatment is again lifestyle modification followed by medical treatment. I think PTNS is a secondary treatment and I think most of us, uh, mostly to me here in KL is done by the urologists. Okay, this question to Dr. Tan. Okay, uh, do you put, do you start, is a bladder diary a necessity before starting treatment? Hello? Hello? Is a bladder diary, is bladder diary a necessity? I think it would be a very helpful adjunct necessity and not just depending on whether the patients are motivated enough and whether they can sort of understand what to do. It's a very good adjunct even before we do urodynamic studies because we will know what their bladder capacity is like. So we aim for that. Yeah. So if they can do it, preferably, but necessity difficult to impose on people who sort of cannot comprehend and do. Okay. And just about the PTNS study, I think the quoted rates of success are something like 50, right up to 80%. But personally, I don't have any experience with it. Yeah, I, all of us don't have, I personally don't have experience because of the success of Botox. Once everything else fails and we do Botox, mm -hmm. Botox has been very successful. So yeah. 
yeah, uh, that is the reason I think all of us have actually shied away from PTNS because of the success of our talks. And with the new drug like Meropagon, we can give double drug. You know, if previously, we only can give one drug. Now with uh, anticholinergic and the Meropagon, so we can give two drugs. So actually that have improved the success markedly. And uh, I think uh, that will all be the question for today. I think we have a good discussion and uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining the uh, for joining the the webinar and uh, we'll meet again in the next webinar. Right. Thank oh, you. oh, there's another question. Hold on. Uh. Uh, 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 once an anti colonizer have been started and assuming it is working, how would your follow-up schedule be like? Uh, this is to Dr. Ida. Okay. So uh, basically, basically the follow-up for patients with anticholinergy, you have to individualize. I mean, you, you can't have one schedule which suits everyone. So you have to look at the background history for the patient. For example, if you have more elderly patient that you start on and the patient has uh, you know, for example, a, a bit of cognitive uh, 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 impairment, demented. You know, you don't want to start the anticholinergic and see them after a month. Okay, so uh, generally, for patients who are more fit, you can actually start patient if you have uh, two. For example, you give uh, you want to start on the lower dose of anti. We always start on the lower dose of anticholinergic. So if you start on the lower dose of anticholinergic, if the patient has not much of medical issues, you can actually see them even after about four weeks. But if you are seeing more vulnerable patients, older patients, patients with uh, multiple comorbids, uh, patients who have very severe symptoms yeah you might want to see the patient about two weeks after all right two weeks after and then see whether the patient develop any symptoms and whether they can tolerate the symptoms but in general if you want to decide whether you want to change to new anti anticholinergic or you want to add on or increase the dose you give in in my practice i usually give about a month as long as uh, the side effect is not too debilitating for the patient okay and then even if let's say if the patient complains of for example dry mouth so you can actually teach the patient some coping mechanism okay you can teach them that you know you can drink water as to thirst and things like that and and you 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 can teach patient some coping mechanism from the side effect that they had Okay, so as long as uh, the, the, the side effect is not too serious, you can actually usually see a patient after a month. Okay, but otherwise see patients two weeks after uh, starting on anticholinergic. So once the patient is comfortable with the certain anticholinergics or you are quite happy of not increasing or changing to other drugs or adding on to another anticholinergic, you can actually see patients maybe once every two, two months or three months. Yeah. And some anticholinergic you can start to taper down as well, okay, uh, according to the patient's symptoms as well as looking at the patient's bladder diary. So if the patient is on treatment and is improving, how long would the treatment be? Uh, Dr. Ida, okay. uh, if the patient has been showing improvement, how mm -hmm. long would the treatment be? I think this is a question that the patient always asks, how mm -hmm. long will we be on treatment? Is it like anti hypertensive for life? Okay. Um, uh, basically, when you see patients on a regular basis, you have to assess the patient's um, symptoms, improvement, worsening. So, um, of course, as I mentioned just now, is if the symptoms is much better, uh, you can actually reflect it from the patient's complaint as well as bladder diary and, and other assessment. Uh, you can start to taper down. For example, if you, you if your patient has been on 8 milligram of Tovias, you can actually reduce it to 4. And then slowly you can even reduce to, uh, you know, sometimes I do put patient on every other day, even though it's off-label, but you can you can actually put patients on every other day. For example, Mira background, I do have patients who are quite happy uh, taking Mira background once or twice a week. 
I mean, when you off it, they have the symptoms, but when you put them on once or twice a week, they're quite happy with it. So you can just continue that for, for a, a longer time, actually. So, And another thing that has to be taken into account is the cost of the treatment. Because as I mentioned in my talk, talk uh, in my talk just now, treatment with anticholinergic can be quite costly. So if there's no use pushing pushing the patient to to go for long term anticholinergic when the patient cannot afford. Okay, so at the end of the day, you need to you need to always emphasize on the non pharmacotherapy uh, treatment uh, lifestyle modification rather than you know uh, looking uh, only on. Uh, pharmacotherapy and 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 uh, basically you try to win off patient from the uh, pharmacotherapy as much as possible. Dr. Tan, what is your practice like? Dr. Tan, GI, what's your practice like? How long would you put patient on treatment? Uh, this is a government hospital. The yeah. cost is not <laughs> an issue. <laughs> right, cost is an issue. So with the anticholinergic, so you don't actually put a timeline to it, but I do tend to explain to the patients that it is an adjunct to their lifestyle modifications. So if we cost is not a huge issue and we have the option of starting it concurrently with lifestyle management, I certainly prefer to. And once their habits improve and they get to this stage where they, they will start asking, can I, can I take it off like Dr. Ida explained? So at that point, we try to wind down the dose and finally aim to take it off completely. Lah. Because older patients, they've already got a whole box of medication, they tend not to want to prefer to continue. But I don't actually put a timeline to it. I, I have a bit, a bit different. I put a timeline. I always counsel my patient, you need a treatment up to six to nine months because 70% of the patient actually do well without the after six to nine months. That 30% sometimes can drag up to years, even with the lifestyle modification. That's what I see in the group I do. And they're very happy, six to nine months, 70% of them actually is asymptomatic, after which I'll see them three monthly. And they actually are very well. But unfortunately, that 30%, the symptoms come back within one month. We give them a, 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 a contact when they call us. And within one month, the symptoms come back. We will restart them again. So that I have a timeline because I was taught in a center that have timeline. Yeah. Because the, like you said, there's a box of treatment. I do not want to give right. that box. I don't want to add any more drugs to that box of uh, drugs they're having. Okay. Uh, question uh, to uh, uh, sorry that uh, to yeah. add on to that. I, I I personally think that things that is another thing that is quite important for you to look at when it comes to how long treatment is is the side effect. You know, sometimes yeah. patient, if the patient is very happy and it helps them, it improves their quality of life, yet they have no symptoms or side adverse reaction from it, I'm quite happy to continue as much as they are happy to continue. Yeah. But most of the time when the patient, you know, they, they say, I, I do have constipation, I'm not very comfortable. So that is when you will try to win them off as fast as possible. There's another question that I think Mr. Warren has left already. The success rate of Botox. I think he already explained the success rate of Botox. I think it's up to 60 to 80 percent, depending on the what type of uh, right now. Right, Ida? Uh, 60 to 80 quoted mm -hmm. huh? success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, 52. So quoted success rate. 60 I mean, it really depends on what is the underlying cause of the. Yeah, um, because now it's only used for IDO, mm. not for other causes. Correct. Okay. And the question of what are the first to all the panelists, what are the first choice of anticholinergics uh, <laughs> that you do you give in your practice? We start with Ida because you work in a private center <laughs> and cost is an issue. Correct. Okay. Uh, it depends on the patient's background. For example, uh, if the patient is elderly, I go for a specific choice like spasmolite or uh, Mirabegron. And that also depends on how much the patient can afford. Because we know you know that spasmolite is cheaper uh, as compared to Mirabegron. But um, if the patient can afford or insurance covers, um, I do start patient on Mirabegron in some cases. But of course, we start off with lower dose of 25. And then if we need to, we increase to 50. But uh, when I was in government hospital last time, um, Actually, it's more of seasonal. You see what's in the market or what's available. 
in the hospital, uh, you can start off with uh, fisoterodine. You can also start off with uh, uh, sol uh, solifernacin first, and also looking at the cost of it. As long as the patient, because you know that some anticholinergic is more expensive than others. For example, like uh, mictonom. You know, mictonom is propivirin. I think, if I'm not mistaken, mictonom or propivirin is one of the cheapest in the market that we have, as far as private practice is concerned. So, uh, and also because uh, I do like uh, propivirin specifically because you can start off with daily dose and increase to BD and TDS. As compared to like uh, uh, Tobias, you have two, four and eight, but there are some like VestiCare, you only can give once a day. So that's it. And if you want to add on, I mean, if, you, if the patient symptoms is not improved, you have to add on to another drug, which I think is a bit more costly for the patient. So I do prefer... Uh, drugs that can you can actually play around with the doses and the frequency rather than one drug and then you have to rather than polypharmacy. Okay, Dr. Tan? So regarding the anticholinergic choices, eh? Yeah, which are the anticholinergic okay. choices do in your practice? Okay, so I think it's someone right. asked what's the first line, that's a dangerous answer, to, that's a dangerous <laughs> question to answer the pharma would be happy. So, I just say that I have some experience with polteridine, solifenacin, and piperavirin. So, as Ida has uh, elucidated, the side effects profile is pretty much the same. So, if one doesn't work, try another. So, I wouldn't say I have a first choice. I have to be politically correct. I think to, be, to be politically correct, <laughs> you see what drugs is available in the correct, government correct. hospital. Yeah. So the, my hospital, the availability is Dr. Rodin, so and Trospium. So at the elderly population, I'll start them on Trospium. For the the other population, I'll start them on Totorodin. And well, we are trying to get Mirabagon into the book because it, it works on those patients who are we don't have much of uh, side effects, especially the anticholinergic side effect. So then we will divide into both and we pick based on the what drug available available in the hospital. I would say uh, my my expertise, I have I have only work, I have worked with Dotorodine, I have worked with uh, Fasoterodine, I have worked with Trospian and Popivarine and Oxybutanin. And I found Oxybutanin have the very good uh, 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 profile. The incontinence of the, the frequency agency works very well, but the side effect of uh, dryness, mouth dryness is really nearly 25% and everybody will stop the treatment. So uh, at the moment, I think in government, practice we I work with whatever drug I have so with Marabagon in I it will it give me a better choice to patients who actually have uh, cognitive functions and we have glaucoma and those patients who have side effects uh, anticholinergic side effects Marabagon will be a very good answer to all this group of patients and we are looking forward to get our Marabagon in the hospital practice Okay, I see there are two more questions. So I asked, I will look into the question. Uh, to the GP, how do GP and primary care doctors want to refer? I mean, what is the procedure of referring? Okay, uh, so I think to Ida and uh, Dr. Tan. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so to government practice, I think not a problem. We just need a referral letter and then just to come into the specialty clinics and just get an appointment. So quite straightforward. Yeah, shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I think that is not an issue. I think everyone can refer straight to the Correct. to the, the ONG send ONG clinic. I think in private it's even easier, Ida. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, I, I, I don't think many GPs uh, manage overactive bladder on their own, mm. mainly because the limitation in uh, medication that they have and also, you know, when you want to put patient on uh, uh, pelvic floor muscle therapy, you do may, you may need to refer to uh, secondary or tertiary centers because that, that, that is where the physiotherapists are. Uh, and also all these anti-mascarinic, anti-cholinergic uh, treatment, um, most of them are uh, with the um, secondary and tertiary hospital and where the urogynists and urologists are. 
So I, I the referring is not a big issue. You you can just uh, write a letter and uh, tell us the concern, and we will do the necessary. Okay, this is a statement. I think uh, uh, it does appears that most have moved away from the oxybutanin. Oxybutanin compared with the recommendation with the nice guideline because of the side effects of low tolerability and adherence. I think this is a statement. So anyone care to comment on this statement? I think if I'm not mistaken, in the nice guideline, they did mention that uh, oxybutanin e extended release oxybutanin, oh, sorry, immediate release oxybutanin should be the first line. And if yeah. you if you want to start patient with other anticholinergic as a first line, you have to mention why you do that. Meaning that they, they emphasize on putting oxybutin in. But um, frankly speaking, I have never used oxybutin in my practice, even when I was in medic in in in, uh, in government hospital before. Mainly because I think the availability of the drugs. So I I don't have much uh, experience with oxybutin in, but. Theoretically, we know that the side effect is actually more, but maybe it's cheaper. I don't know, Dr. Ang, is it? Uh, Dr. Tan, have you any experience with oxybutanin in Australia? No, I haven't used oxybutanin, but I think probably I suspect the guidelines are coming from the fact that it's an older drug, so probably the safety profile should be longer and perhaps cheaper as well. Uh. So now with so much, so many drugs in the our available to us, that's why I agree that oxybutanin has fallen down the list. Uh, I would, uh, I, I have experience using ox oxybutanin in Singapore because Singapore, every patient pay. Oxybutanin is cheap compared to Dr. Rodin. And I, I say it really works wonders. It, it really, the control of continence, the control of frequency, urgency, nocturia is really wonderful. But unfortunately, more than one third of them will come back I want to stop this drug because of the side effect. And very commonly side effect is dry mouth followed by constipation and also some even have blurred vision. So it is a very good drug. However, I think we have moved away. I think maybe it's a nice guideline because it is a cheap drug. I think, uh, I'm not sure about the nice, maybe you need to buy the Thorodin. So that's why Oxyputani is always as the first choice because it's a very much cheaper drug compared to Totorodin. Totorodin that time was selling as ninety sing dollar when this is very cheap, a few cents per tablet. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're all using Oxyputani in Singapore compared to Totorodin. But the results are very good. But the side effects are quite bad, twenty five percent at least. Okay, and I will take in the last question. Uh, I think this uh, uh, as a question. Since Mirabagon is cheaper, can we use as the first line? Any takers for this question? Even if it's not cheaper, I think you can still use it as a first line treatment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do start patient with Mirabagon as first line. I mean, as I mentioned just now, looking at the background uh, background of the patient, if the patient is, uh, you, you, you suspect, I mean, you, you do assess patient with uh, more uh, impairment in cognitive function, older patients, patients uh, uh, who, who has a bit, uh, example of patient with constipation, you know, some patients when they come to see you, they have overactive bladder and they already tell you that, oh, I do have constipation. So in this type of patient, you want to go as, as, less side effect as possible. So in this type of patient, I do start them on Mirabagron instead as first line. Uh, Dr. Tan? Yeah, I, I think Dr. Mr. Warren mentioned as well, I mean, it's nice for patients with glaucoma, the rare cases of myasthenia, it's very good as a first line. But if they have the option of both, yeah, certainly, why not when, this, when you know the side effect is much better? But the challenge I have is every time our older patients come to see us, the blood, the blood pressure will shoot through the roof. So correct, correct, correct. <laughs> so I say, you, you have to look at the background. I mean, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very selective in patients with uh, hypertension. If the patient has hypertension, I usually avoid mirror background as first line. We yeah, go I for see. other cheaper ones, you know. Uh, I think uh, I think the last question I think is about prolapse stage one. I think this is a, a OAB will personally answer the question uh, will not answer the question at this moment of time. So I would like to, uh, I think it's nearly time. I would like to thank the speaker for giving such a, a, a good talk. I would like to thank the participant for joining and giving us so much questions. Very very good question for us. Uh, 
uh, for us then I would like to, uh, to thank OGSM for organizing this webinar series. I hope all the participants uh, benefit from this talk and I personally think that like in UK we can be managed in, in the GP settings but provided you have to fulfill certain criteria before you start fishing on treatment uh, that all those that uh, our speakers have informed you what are the complications, what are the side effects, what are the contraindications so, any last words from our speaker, Dr. Ida? Oh, um, thank you for OGSM again uh, for inviting us and I hope that uh, most, I mean, all of you ben benefits from the talk that we have given. And uh, uh, we, we always need to update ourselves on the new uh, information on overactive bladder and urogyne as, as a whole. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Tan, any last words? Yeah, so thank you to OGSM as well for organizing this great initiative. So thank you, Dr. Ng, for moderating and thank you to Ida as well. Nice to see you again. And yeah, so very common condition. So I've learned a lot as well today from the other speakers. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you.